Muy buenas tardes a todas. Good evening to everyone. My name is Maria del Carmen Alanis. I am a professor of uh, the School of Law of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Today, we're really pleased to have you all here. We have the president of the INE and the director of the School of Law of the National University reached an agreement that to hold a permanent uh, seminar entitled Democracy and Elections in the World, which today is uh, starting with its uh, first uh, session or panel on elections in the US, part one. We're joined also by the following individuals. And by the way, we want to thank uh, the presence of uh, Lorenzo Cordova Vianello, the uh, Councilor President of INE, and Raul Contreras Bustamante, the Director of the School of Law of the National University. Also, we have the presence of uh, Minister uh, Diana Brown, who is a Councilor uh, for Political Affairs of the U.S. Embassy of North America in Mexico. Welcome, um, Mrs. Uh, Brown. As panelists, we have uh, experts uh, such as Anne Ravel, which is the director of uh, the Deception Project, a uh, digital project, and uh, she is a former commissioner of the Federal Commission of Elections of the U.S. Anne Ravel. And uh, we have uh, Richard Sudriet, international consultant and former president of the International Foundation of Electoral Systems, IFES. Uh, IFIS, uh, welcome, Richard. It's a pleasure to see you again. And then we have uh, Ambassador Arturo Sarocan, international consultant and former um, diplomat uh, representing Mexico. It's a pleasure to have you here, Mr. Sarocan. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to all the people interested in democracy and elections in the world. Thank you for uh, joining uh, this event. This event is uh, being streamed uh, uh, live uh, through uh, the YouTube uh, channels of uh, the INE and uh, the School of Law. And uh, the audience uh, is made up of uh, students, uh, electoral officials of the INE, and from electoral uh, bodies all over Mexico in the country. And especially, we also have the participation of officials uh, from the electoral um, organizations uh, in uh, the uh, continent participating in this group. Next, we'll have uh, Raul Contreras uh, to give uh, some uh, welcoming uh, remarks. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Alanis. Uh, good evening to each and all of you, especially those uh, watching us uh, live. We're broadcasting on uh, Facebook Live and Twitter uh, through this uh, virtual uh, classroom or meeting room as a part of this strategic uh, partnership that the School of Law of the National University has established with the National Electoral Institute. As uh, Dr. Alanis said, we're starting uh, today with this uh, seminar entitled Democracy and Elections in the World with the purpose of reaching a series of conclusions uh, that allow us uh, to improve electoral practices in the different countries in Latin America and the US. Because uh, there is no other um, national state or territorial exercise that uh, has the same magnitude uh, in terms of operation, as well as uh, large uh, participation and legal and procedural complexity. There is no process more complex uh, than uh, electoral processes. And now that uh, we're amid uh, the pandemic, elections in the world are facing huge challenges when it comes to their functioning or operation because uh, there is an interest in um, not seeing a lower vo voter uh, turnout and also um, ensuring that uh, voters have access uh, to uh, safe uh, locations to vote to uh, prevent uh, infections and uh, a series of other considerations that we will discuss in this seminar today today as uh, which uh, today we're, when we are talking about uh, the elections in the US, uh, the School of Law and the INE, the National Electoral Institute, uh, will be attentive uh, to uh, upcoming uh, elections in the US, taking into consideration that, in fact, in the, uh, we will have uh, federal elections uh, soon. 
including uh, many positions uh, such as uh, governorships, uh, state le legislatures, and municipalities. We will try to take note of uh, anything that happens or everything that happens in the US uh, to learn uh, from the complications that we'll face uh, given the large number of voters uh, in uh, this uh, country in North and also given the complexity, uh, the size and the dimension of uh, the uh, positions uh, to be elected. We know that in the election of 2021 in Mexico, we will see the largest election ever in uh, history in the country. Of course, uh, there is no parallel between our populations because uh, you have more people, but still we need to pay attention to uh, the evolution of elections in the US. We will also um, be keeping an eye to uh, see if uh, the uh, electoral system in the US uh, can um, handle uh, these elections. Uh, uh, this indirect system they have uh, is something that is being put to the test. So it's either that or we may see a one third uh, time uh, where a candidate uh, will get or may get the more direct votes but not win the elections anyways. We'll also uh, be attentive uh, to the circumstances in the US when it comes to tallying votes and the announcement of official results in an attempt uh, to analyze the situation and establish uh, uh, comparisons between Mexico and the US. We'll also be attentive uh, to uh, postal uh, voting um, because in Mexico, we're uh, receiving uh, postal uh, votes uh, from Mexicans living outside of uh, Mexico. And of course, we will be uh, keeping an eye on the results uh, to see if uh, there are uh, uh, challenges uh, to the results and eventually um, um, lawsuits or uh, legal complaints about it. So we will be paying a lot of attention to our uh, group of uh, panelists and experts. And of course, we will try to share uh, this information and these events so that uh, we can uh, increase our level of knowledge in both countries. We want to thank our distinguished uh, guests uh, for uh, joining uh, this session uh, at the invitation of Mrs. Alanis, and we're ready to learn from you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Contreras. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, the uh, president of uh, the INE uh, who will speak uh, for a maximum of uh, seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Mary Carmen. I would like to start uh, by uh, thanking uh, several people um, who are really important. Uh, first, I would like to thank um, Mr. Contreras, uh, the uh, uh, dean of uh, the School of Law. Uh, because uh, we are ex-alumni of uh, this school. Uh, thank you, uh, Raul, for this uh, partnership and this additional example of a strategic uh, collaboration between the School of Law and uh, my institute, the institute I live in. Thanks to Mari Carmen for being the mastermind, the mastermind uh, behind uh, this event uh, because uh, she's also organizing it. This is a permanent seminar that I am sure will uh, be really successful. For anyone interested in uh, democratic systems, it's obvious that elections in the US are truly important. This is not only about uh, getting to know or learning uh, who uh, won the presidency in the most uh, powerful uh, country of the world or uh, the distribution of uh, the chamber of uh, uh, the, 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 the lower chamber. I mean, or what uh, will be the direction of uh, multilateral organizations or the direction of uh, bilateral uh, policy, which is one of the most intense uh, ones with Mexico, depending on the winning party. It's about uh, trying to uh, see how uh, this um, all democracy is uh, facing and will change uh, three major challenges that any democratic society uh, faces. First, uh, the influence of uh, social media on the election. Number two, the measures uh, to address um, the pandemic of COVID-19. And number three, accepting uh, defeat as uh, an element uh, for democratic systems. Uh, I look back into uh, democracies in uh, the continent over the last uh, five years allows us to say that these are not good times for democracy worldwide. As uh, Cicero said, I mean, there is a low level of uh, trust uh, among uh, citizens uh, in political parties, uh, politics, and governments. 
there is an increasing level of polarization in our societies, a high level of intolerance in uh, the public debate, which is growing every single day, especially on social media, as well as a uh, generational change and uh, this attachment or distancing uh, from institutional uh, institutions, as well uh, as the problems of poverty, inequality, and unemployment that are the uh, maximum expression of the unfulfilled promises of democracy and one of the biggest structural uh, problems of the world, of the modern world. These are all phenomena that uh, were already announcing uh, the threats on democracy in all the regions of the planet that have been going on for several years. In particular, four years ago, elections in the US and recent political changes uh, brought uh, by uh, the so-called uh, Arab Spring uh, fueled the debate on the influence of social media in the democratic context. And uh, both uh, the emergence of anti-system uh, candidates, uh, whether they were from the left or right, and the exaltation of a uh, uh, direct democracy exercise like Brexit or uh, the success of peace in Colombia were challenges uh, that reflected a uh, wearing out of the processes in the representative democracies, uh, the holding of international forums, uh, regional forums, uh, seminars, uh, workshops with the participation of uh, government and uh, electoral uh, officials uh, are a testimony of these challenges. But in 2020, we saw something unprecedented that uh, transformed all the uh, forecasts uh, possible uh, for democracy. The emergence of a new coronavirus that uh, in addition to being unknown to uh, scientists in all the planet, uh, is easily transmitted, which uh, forced uh, WHO uh, to declare that uh, there was a state of emergency worldwide, a pandemic. This added uh, another uh, level of complexity to the bad moment experienced by this uh, democracy. Uh, in addition to facing this unheard of uh, situation, um, politicians and governors uh, or um, people in government have tended uh, to um, modify uh, the basic principles of democracy and concentrate the uh, powers in the executive to deal with the emergency. The pandemic is questioning uh, the essential factors of uh, um, electoral coexistence. Uh, such a challenging context uh, like the one I mentioned involves or implies uh, the need uh, to reflect on elections, especially those of our neighbor, which uh, is something we should do. And also, it's a responsibility uh, for all the institutions uh, committed uh, to the organization of elections and the exercise of political rights uh, for our populations. To this end, to enrich our perspective about uh, what's uh, coming uh, in terms of uh, international democracy, and uh, considering that uh, we're, we'll be holding um, the largest and most, most complex elections in Mexico soon in 2021, I want to take advantage of the opportunity so that um, you can join us uh, in this seminar uh, together uh, with um, the uh, School of Law. Thank you for joining uh, this seminar, Democracy and Elections in the World, organized uh, by the INE and the School of Law, the most important one in Latin America, which is uh, the one that belongs to the National Autonomous University of Mexico. The idea is to uh, have a monthly meeting on measures uh, taken or adopted in countries like Chile, Ecuador, Paraguay, uh, Peru, and of course the US, uh, which is uh, the first uh, case of analysis today, to uh, develop a, a, a bank of experiences uh, on the ways uh, these uh, challenges are being faced democratically, but also to reflect on up-to-date uh, matters, issues, and uh, potential uh, routes or paths that uh, electoral systems will follow worldwide with a single logic. The fact that democracy or our democracies should not become another victim of COVID-19. I am truly convinced that uh, reflecting on democracy is something that uh, goes beyond the electoral um, issue. And it has uh, to do with the roots of civilization in mankind, peaceful, tolerant coexistence between minorities and majorities in conditions of equality. Let me just uh, finish by saying that, in my opinion, the problems of democracy must be solved with the tools of democracy and instead of uh, finding uh, the easy way out the concentration, the authoritarian concentration of powers. In other words, for democracy not to become another victim of the pandemic, our uh, countries have two choices. 
coming out of it, uh, concentrating power and um, being authoritarian or defending uh, democratic conquests that um, were conquered a while ago to show that democracy will prevail. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, these are important uh, thoughts, uh, especially when you talk about how this uh, pandemic has uh, changed the uh, decision-making processes uh, everywhere, but especially in electoral matters. Next, we have uh, Dana Brown. She will have 10 minutes. Uh, please, uh, Dana. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, good, uh, good evening. First of all, I would like to thank uh, each and all of you for your participation, for your invitation, excuse me, uh, to uh, participate here on behalf of Christopher Lando and the Embassy of the U.S. in Mexico. I would like to tell you that uh, it's a real honor to be able to participate in this event uh, and share a few words of uh, reflection. It's an honor uh, to uh, have an opportunity to greet uh, Lorenzo Cordova Vianello again, as well as Dr. Raul Contreras Bustamante and uh, the different uh, speakers uh, uh, present uh, today. And of course, I'm honored uh, to be here uh, with uh, them, but also with uh, all the audience. To begin, to begin with, uh, let me uh, definitely tell you that uh, this is an interesting uh, moment in the region. In addition to uh, dealing with the health crisis, several countries must continue with our democratic uh, processes and organize elections, even amid a pandemic like this. But even amid a pandemic like this, uh, democracy cannot wait. Uh, US voters uh, will cast their vote next uh, um, Tuesday, November the 3rd, even though the election uh, began uh, weeks earlier. Unlike other countries, including Mexico, the US has a long tradition of uh, early voting, either in person or by mail. To date, more than 80 million people have already uh, voted in the US, which uh, is something impressive in my opinion. This will be a record uh, number when it comes to early voting in our history. Nine days uh, before uh, the election, uh, more people have uh, cast uh, their early vote in this process, or in this electoral process than and the total of uh, early uh, voters in 2016. This uh, number uh, clearly shows the enthusiasm of uh, voters in this election. According uh, to a survey conducted by Gallup in early uh, October, 67% of voters uh, reported that uh, they were more enthusiastic about voting on these elections compared to previous elections, which is uh, the um, highest uh, number uh, in this uh, year. Among the most interesting or uh, among the main topics of concern among voters, we have the economy uh, dealing with the pandemic, security, and the health system, which means that the pandemic is having an impact both on uh, uh, voters' uh, choices and uh, the organization of the election itself. On the other hand, the high number of early voters is also a sign of the challenges involved in uh, organizing a mass election amid uh, health uh, crisis. The increase in the number of um, postal votes is also related uh, to a uh, fear of uh, getting infected in uh, polling stations. Several countries, uh, several, excuse me, um, states in the country um, amended their laws uh, to uh, facilitate uh, postal voting and reduce the number of people present in uh, polling stations. Uh, the early voting system will be a challenge for the postal service in the US because uh, the postal service will have uh, to uh, deal with a more uh, postal packages. The director of the Postal Service uh, says that they have not uh, changed uh, their systems uh, to deal with uh, postal voting. But uh, he assured that uh, the process uh, will uh, be successful, which is important. What these uh, high uh, percentages of early voting in the US show is that the pandemic will not stop the enthusiasm of uh, people when it comes uh, to casting their vote and expressing their opinion on election day. 
or in the election period, if you will. Um, this being the reason why uh, the authorities will have to put measures in place to uh, avoid uh, health risks, to avoid uh, in cases of infections in the uh, polling stations. So each state will implement the measures to reduce the uh, risks uh, for voters. These uh, um, measures include, for example, the use of uh, face masks, um, marks on the floor uh, to uh, keep uh, social distancing, uh, the use of hand sanitizer to uh, disinfect their hands, and also asking voters uh, to uh, show up with their own uh, markers or pens uh, to uh, cross out their ballots. Also, uh, they will have uh, larger uh, facilities, uh, including uh, venues such as stadiums uh, to install or set up uh, polling stations uh, that will allow for more social distancing between voters. Many of these measures uh, we have seen implemented by electoral authorities in Mexico too. I would like to commend the INE and the state electoral institutes in Mexico, uh, all of which organized uh, elections recently in uh, the states of Hidalgo and Coahuila with measures to prevent the infections uh, between uh, or among uh, voters. We can all learn from good electoral practices in other countries to uh, figure out what works, what not, and where we have to improve. And I also I like the fact that we can hold or participate in uh, seminars like this uh, to share experiences on a situation that is completely exceptional. I believe that uh, no country uh, in the world uh, ever anticipated uh, being in this situation. And having to think uh, about uh, ways of organizing elections differently is uh, something key. Each case, of course, will be different. But there are common elements that we can use as a reference uh, to promote uh, people's right to vote in a safe manner. Once again, I would like to thank uh, each and all of you uh, for your invitation to participate in this seminar. And I truly hope that we can continue to work together to the benefit of the relationship between our countries and the benefit of democracy. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Minister R. Brown. And thank you uh, for uh, congratulating uh, electoral authorities uh, in Mexico, local authorities uh, for organizing these uh, recent elections, uh, which in effect um, followed all the standards necessary so that the people could vote safely. Well, uh, this is uh, basically protocol, uh, but now formally we can start uh, with uh, our presenters. Uh, to begin with, I would like uh, to give the floor to Ms. Uh, Ravel. As I already mentioned, uh, she was a commissioner and head of the Federal Elections uh, Commission of the U.S. Let's um, give priority to uh, the presentations themselves. I won't read your bios. That was a request. Uh, uh, and uh, go ahead, uh, Anravel. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, we really want to listen to you. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, I, let me say, as, as um, Ms. Brown uh, indicated, we have had unbelievable turnout in mail balloting. And also in many states, there's also uh, drop-off balloting. But I think a lot of this is because, um, clearly, because of COVID-19, together with um, a number of the attacks by the president of the United States on mail-in balloting, um, there is a lot of um, concern in the country and people are feeling very uncertain about it. In fact, there was a recent poll done um, by University of California, um, Berkeley, uh, where they said, and this was done in California, mind you, that has had a history of mail balloting. Um, they said that four in 10 likely voters said that it was either not too likely or not at all likely that the election would be fair and open in the United States. Um, and also, the poll indicated that nine in 10 
California voters um, expected that there was going to be post-election violence um, that would be very likely in the United States because of disputes against about the election, which, um, and um, thank you, uh, Mr. Cordova, for your uh, statements, because um, this is something that is really quite concerning in this country and it's very worrisome because it is true more people are want to participate um, in their democracy in part because of the concerns but also just because of as you spoke of the divisiveness in this country and and the uh, much more concern about our political process. So um, we're we're conducting this election in the middle of COVID, uh, in the middle of all of these issues that we have. Um, but it is uh, mail-in balloting actually is not fraudulent, um, and it is there's not uh, um, an issue with it. Uh, because there have been studies done of fraud that has actually occurred over the last 10 years. And it is something like 0.00001% of the cases that really involve any true fraud in mail-in balloting. It's a very small number. Um, and not anything that people should be concerned about. But there is this heightened um, sense that perhaps there's going to be a problem or there's going to be a problem at the because of the mail and potential delays in the mail. Although, as Ms. Brown said, the Mr. DeJoy, who's the Postmaster General, said did initially uh, remove machine sorting machines and the like and causing a lot of people concern but there have been a number of court cases that have forced him to keep the numbers um, stable and so um, there has not been a major change in the way that the mail ballots are going to be processed. Um, in addition, as, as many of you probably know, in the United States, um, polling and decisions about voting are local. Every state has their own rules, which makes it um, even more difficult because some states um, are less willing to have, for example, early voting. Some states do have early voting. Um, and in some states, it turns out, uh, because people are concerned about the mail and you can actually vote um, even by mail as long as your ballot is postmarked on the date November 3rd, which is the last day for voting. However, um, there's been a lot of discussion and a, three Supreme Court cases already over the issue of uh, how long afterwards uh, can those votes be counted. And the, there's a difference depending on what state it's in. So some states will require that counting to be done within a day, the day after of the election, which is crazy, uh, even if they are um, postmarked on that date. So all of these um, differentials state by state have also caused a lot of concern for people. And the other problem is, of course, that we have a, a really um, diverse country and a lot of people, particularly people who are not um, English language speakers, or at least not particularly Latinos, um, don't necessarily feel comfortable filling out vote by mail ballots and would prefer to be at a polling place where they can get assistance from a person who's there uh, to help them to vote. Because in some states, it, this is true in California, the ballots, of course, as was mentioned, 
it's not just for president and vice president. It includes a lot of state offices. It includes in California about 20 ballot measures. And so the ballots are very long and very complicated. Um, but of course, the problem with polling stations now, um, yes, they are all probably going to be cleaned and they're going to be socially distanced. And that is a good thing. On the other hand, in the primaries and also in the, in the general elections, many of those polling stations have been combined, um, in part because not for, for reasons that are negative, but because the thought was <clears throat> there would be fewer people voting um, because of COVID uh, in person. Um, but also um, because of cost. And what that has meant for the most part is that especially in minority communities where people tend to more want to vote in person, um, there are fewer polling places. So in even some of the places where they've already been voting, um, but in the primary, certainly there were lines of people waiting to vote for hours. In New York City, some people waited five hours. In Georgia, the same. And there were also problems at the polling places because um, some of the machines weren't working properly, and yet they did not have sufficient materials in vote by mail or vote by paper that people could then vote there as well uh, by paper. So there is a lot of concern about that. And the other issue that um, has arisen and has arisen in this uh, country just generally is um, there's been a change to the Voting Rights Act in the United States. The Voting Rights Act um, was enacted in 1965, and it uh, provides that there could be no discrimination against voters because of race, color, or any other inappropriate reason. Um, and that law is still good. But <clears throat> what also uh, was a provision of that act was that certain states that ha had a history of voter suppression particularly against um, African-Americans, um, but also, <coughs> excuse me, also in some cases, Latinos. Um, and those people have been dissuaded uh, from voting for various reasons, either um, their vote by mail votes uh, have, have been uh, disqualified, sometimes because of small issues, uh, such as um, it, the, the signature didn't look exactly right, or maybe somebody had a period or a dash instead of something that they have on their registration forms. And for that reason, um, lots of, of ballots have been disqualified, even in California, where there's probably no racial animus at all. There were um, many thousands of ballots that were disqualified in the primary election in California. And this is something that is has been typically used um, throughout the country in those states that used to be required to have preclearance. But then since that was struck down, they are now engaging in those same kinds of voter suppression. And there's a lot of fear about this. In fact, um, I was just sent something from a friend of mine from the Department of Justice where they were saying that the number of African-Americans and Latinos in the United States are not voting in large numbers, in fact, because they are concerned about these issues. And so they have just not um, been the ones who are submitting their votes. The numbers have been much, much lower. So that is, that is a really big concern for this country. 
And one of the things that we're going to have to um, figure out a way to bring back some of those, um, and of course that was a Supreme Court decision, so uh, it's going to be a little more difficult to do, but there's going to have to be some ways to bring back some of those protections to make sure that people do not feel that their votes are going to be uh, discounted or also that they might have more difficulty actually registering to vote, even though they are citizens and able to vote. And in fact, that is another issue that has come up in several places around the country, because in the United States, and as in, I know, in other countries, um, people can be poll watchers. They can go to make sure that things are being done properly, that it's safe, <clears throat> and yet, here, um, and this came also from the President of the United States, who suggested, people, you need to go and stand around and, and be poll watchers. Well, a number of people are worried that there will be people who are like militias, um, people who will come with guns, and that itself is a reason to intimidate people to not come to the polling place. And that is a major concern. And that um, in Michigan, the um, Secretary of State uh, said, you know, this is a rule, no one can bring guns uh, in open carry to the polling place. And the one of, one of the parties brought litigation against her saying that um, they have a right to carry, it's a First Amendment right to carry their weapons. Um, so that is another aspect of voter suppression that causes people, particularly those who might be concerned about um, immigration status or relatives with immigration status or the like to not um, want to show up at the polls. Um, so all of those um, things are some of the issues um, that we're facing and that we really need to make sure that the democratic process in this country is not undermined in any way by these kinds of activities. And then of course, the, the issue sort of at the end is uh, that everybody is concerned about in this country is also whether or not, um, in particular, if Biden wins, if um, the president is going to accept it. And part of that issue comes about because, because of, of um, the large number of vote, voters uh, and same-day same voting. And in California, you can actually register on the same day, like November 3rd. And so it takes some time to go through the registration to make sure that that vote can be counted. Um, so as a result, unlike in past years when the, the media has announced who the, the likely winner is, um, media has been asked not to do that. Um, the tech companies, and, and Mr. Cordova, you spoke about that issue of, of digital deception and disinformation, and the tech companies have, have agreed to remove that kind of information from their um, platforms because they, they feel that people will not accept the vote once it comes out, and the likelihood is that we won't really know the outcome of the election, especially you know, for president or, or, or vice president, until potentially a week later, um, unless the vote is so overwhelming um, in swing states that it might be obvious, but otherwise it's not gonna be known. And in the past, everyone has known it the day of the election. And it, people are really worried that there is going to be not only foreign interference in the, um, on the internet and on platforms trying to uh, raise that specter and, and make people feel 
more violent and and add to the um, sort of sense that it's doubtful that the election was fair. And so I know I only have a couple minutes, but um, and there may be people that have questions. But um, I hate to be such a such a negativist, but you know these are things that those of us who care about democracy in this country and anywhere in the world are really worried about. Thank you, Anne Gravel. It is not a uh, negative, it's, it's real. It's uh, uh, what you are living now in the United States. I was telling uh, Anne Rabel that uh, it's not a uh, negativism, it's uh, the reality you're experiencing or living in the US where you have a complex electoral system and where you have a divided society. So of course, that the context of uh, the pandemic only exacerbates that. And uh, uh, like in many other countries, that is a reason for concern. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ravel. Um, your uh, thoughts were really interesting and provoking. I'm sure that uh, during the Q&A, uh, we will receive uh, some additional questions or comments. Let me uh, now introduce uh, Richard Sudriet, international consultant and former president of uh, the International Foundation of Electoral Systems. Richard, uh, you have 15 minutes, please. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary del Carmen. Uh, to begin with, I would like to uh, thank uh, Raul Contreras as well as uh, Lorenzo uh, Cordova and uh, the INE team and the UNAM uh, team. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. And uh, also, I want to thank uh, Dana Brown uh, from uh, the U.S. Embassy for her participation. And it's a real pleasure uh, for me uh, to uh, be part of this distinguished uh, group of panelists. And Ravel is uh, famous all throughout the U.S. Uh, she's a renowned uh, individual. She's done an outstanding work. And she did an outstanding uh, work with the Federal Electoral Commission. And it's a real uh, pleasure also to see uh, my long uh, time uh, friend not because he's old, but he's a longtime friend, Arturo Sarocan. And uh, but it, I believe that there is a mistake uh, in the title of uh, today's uh, lecture because uh, you're talking about elections uh, in the US. And I believe that it would be possibly better to talk about the new episode of this 2020 reality show. That's the way I would call it, a reality show. Because uh, uh, sadly, I mean, if it wasn't that uh, bad, it would move you to laugh, laughter. So having said that, uh, thank you uh, for giving me uh, an opportunity to share uh, some uh, thoughts. First of all, I would like to talk about uh, three things in particular. Number one, threats, challenges, and uh, the lessons uh, that we expect uh, to learn from all of this. Uh, to begin with, I would like to tell you that thinking about organizing elections uh, uh, in the middle of the pandemic is not an easy uh, fit. This year, approximately 84 uh, countries uh, have uh, scheduled uh, elections, including the US. But it has not been easy, which clearly shows that anywhere in the world, uh, the key uh, to holding elections had been uh, the capacity of electoral officials who now have to adapt to uh, this situation, a situation as uh, complex as uh, the one we're living uh, through the, the pandemic. It's interesting uh, to go back uh, to the words of a uh, Greek historian uh, Thucydides. He spoke about uh, the pest of Athens that uh, took place in uh, uh, the, uh, the fourth uh, century um, um, DC. A lot of uh, people died as a result of uh, this uh, pest and that pest actually uh, destroyed uh, the uh, democracy in Athens. 
this uh, philosopher had already talked about uh, the, uh, the dangers of these uh, pests and calamities. It's important to think about it because to some extent, that's what we're dealing with today. And, uh, and that's what all electoral administrators are facing today. How can we hold uh, credible and free elections at the same time we deal with um, measures uh, to protect uh, the health uh, the health and lives of uh, citizens and uh, voters but as we have seen in other countries including the us it is rather obvious that uh, uh, all the people involved uh, in organization of elections are doing everything in their power to uh, protect the right of people to vote which is uh, to the benefit of mankind. In these upcoming elections in the US, we have uh, witnessed uh, several uh, challenges. The first one is how to uh, ensure uh, the process, a credible process, but in a safe environment that uh, truly uh, protects uh, the health of uh, voters, and also making sure that electoral uh, bodies can share uh, the right uh, information with uh, voters, especially during a situation like uh, this, the situation of uh, the pandemic and where you have a lot of rumors and uh, fake news. That is uh, really important uh, when it comes to uh, figuring out a strategy uh, to improve the credibility of the process. And finally, how can we enforce the law? That is the third question. And also apply democratic values in our countries especially in our case in the United States, because that's the only way to really protect um, the legitimacy of uh, votes. Despite these threats, I believe that uh, we have uh, seen or confirmed the fact that these uh, challenges have definitely have uh, uh, motivated electoral officials uh, to explore new ways of doing things and implementing new processes. I mean, all of them uh, implemented uh, protocols, including uh, the use of uh, face masks, uh, social distancing, and um, Mrs. Ravel already talked about it, uh, so I won't mention it again. Um, but I know that officials in the U.S. have uh, faced a lot of uh, challenges uh, when it comes to recruiting uh, people uh, to work at the polling stations. That has been a challenge. The problem is that in recent years, the the average age of these uh, workers uh, was uh, 65 uh, all the way to 70 years. But uh, with this uh, pandemic, we have, we still have the same group of people working uh, uh, in uh, polling stations and uh, electoral uh, uh, teams, which means that uh, they have the need uh, to uh, figure out new ways of uh, doing uh, things and, and recruiting uh, more people. And some electoral uh, commissions are uh, exploring the possibility of recruiting uh, young people, including some that may not be old enough uh, to vote, but who may get uh, credits uh, for their uh, support or their help. Uh, and this is the kind of things uh, they're doing. We have also uh, seen an increasing uh, trend out of uh, polling stations uh, close uh, to uh, the voters' address. We have seen uh, an increase in the number of uh, polling stations. 
that's my point. Uh, Colorado is one of the first uh, states uh, to implement the system. And it was a great idea because uh, more polling stations uh, means uh, that they can implement uh, the right uh, measures to protect the health of voters. At the same time, in the case of uh, early voting, we're seeing something else that is interesting in my opinion, really interesting in my opinion. As we all know, there are, for example, restaurants that were affected um, as a result of uh, the pandemic. And uh, we have uh, seen uh, people uh, showing up at polling stations, uh, sharing food with uh, voters standing in line, which is interesting uh, because uh, I had seen this uh, situation in Latin America uh, for many years, but it would seem to be something new in the US, uh, that sense of uh, solidarity. I mean, people are going out to the streets uh, to uh, support or help others and they're adapting because uh, some restaurants had to close as a result of uh, COVID-19, as uh, Dana and um, uh, others had, uh, as Dana and uh, Anne have already mentioned, uh, we have a new reality uh, in the case of uh, uh, postal voting. Today, we have uh, more than 80 million people uh, voting prior to the election. I mean, 80 million people having voted uh, prior to uh, November the 3rd. We're talking about 59% of the total uh, number of votes uh, for 2016. So, I believe that this uh, clearly shows that uh, we will have a significant uh, level of uh, voter uh, turnout, maybe uh, between uh, 60, 70, or maybe as high as 75%, which uh, would be uh, the highest ever uh, in the last uh, half a century. So it's interesting to see how people uh, want uh, to vote. And it's interesting uh, to see how mm, they have received uh, so many uh, fake news about uh, postal voting. And yes, some people do not uh, trust uh, uh, postal voting. Uh, and that's the reason why many other people will uh, want uh, to uh, do early voting. Even though the number of uh, uh, mail votes is uh, larger, I don't believe that uh, after the process, I believe that after the process, we won't see uh, that many votes. And Republicans and Democrats uh, were afraid that uh, the process would fail. And they wanted to make sure that the votes accounted. And that's an example of how things have changed. So, the difference uh, between uh, the U.S. and other countries is that we have a really decentralized system, which means that the federal government actually does not play a direct role in the administration of elections. I mean including a federal, a local, or a state. All of that, or all those processes are in the hands of state and local officials. And there are some 25,000 uh, persons working on that. We know of uh, the problems uh, uh, we had in uh, 2000 uh, with uh, Bush. After year 2000, we have uh, um, seen a lot of uh, progress. The federal uh, government uh, assisted not uh, with the election administrations, but uh, they um, provided help uh, to modernize uh, voting equipment and uh, registration uh, uh, systems. And uh, in all the different states, we have also seen uh, significant efforts uh, to uh, professionalize uh, electoral management. So I am really confident uh, today 
that uh, despite these ridiculous rumors we are seeing, I believe that uh, we shouldn't worry about them because I am confident that the result will be accurate and votes will count. But the complication in all of this is that in the US, we have an indirect system. We have a, a popular vote. And to some extent that uh, this uh, vote uh, decides uh, the allocation of uh, votes in each state. But the only way for a candidate to win is if he or she wins the majority of electoral votes, which are 270 uh, votes. So it's kind of complicated. All the different states except for Maine and Nebraska, when uh, they vote, all the uh, their votes uh, go uh, to uh, the uh, candidate uh, winning uh, the popular vote. But in the other two cases, states have uh, changed. So the congressional districts assign a vote uh, to the winner. So we're talking about a fairly complicated uh, system uh, to some extent. But the thing is that in the US, sadly, we are so divided now that there are only there are only about eight states where uh, the competition is so tight that companies are and that's where uh, companies are focusing on their uh, efforts in california the democratic party has a lot of power uh, there as well as in other states like uh, texas uh, the so-called uh, red states uh, belong to the Republicans. But again, it's complicated. And that's why we have uh, seen so much interest in these eight states, such as Florida, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. The last time uh, Trump uh, won the election in the Electoral College, but he lost uh, the popular uh, vote and he uh, won because uh, he uh, won uh, in Michigan and Pennsylvania. And that's the way it happened. Well, to wrap up, there are three possibilities in my opinion. First, Biden winning uh, by far, in which case uh, he would uh, won on the electoral vote and the popular vote, uh, which would be uh, great. Even though uh, those who love uh, Trump uh, wouldn't uh, take that. We hope uh, they admit that their defeat. Uh, number two, the possibility of uh, Trump winning, but uh, not uh, winning uh, via a popular vote, but winning again uh, uh, through the Electoral College. And the big nightmare would be if the uh, two of them are almost uh, in a tie, in which case uh, I believe that we would uh, possibly see uh, weeks and weeks of uh, debate, disputes, in which uh, case uh, the uh, solution would have to uh, go to the Supreme Court. The problem if, uh, is that if uh, there is a tay, uh, there would be uh, some uh, level of uh, danger uh, possible because uh, there will be people that there will be people that uh, would never accept uh, the results. And that would be a democratic uh, failure. And finally, what are the lessons that we're learning? Number one, that uh, enforcing the law is the most important thing. We need to follow the law. And that's why it's important uh, to um, 
know about the laws in each state. And also campaigns that should uh, follow the law. And the other thing, the other lesson learned is a humbleness, which is important because sometimes uh, countries uh, like the US believe, hey, we're helping other countries, we're helping other democracies, and uh, we're looking good. But um, there is there is not an electoral nirvana. Each democracy or country must uh, continue uh, to uh, work, adapt, learn and improve. So we uh, will certainly learn uh, from many of the challenges uh, this year, especially organizing credible elections amid uh, the pandemic. And finally, we know that the future of uh, democracy is in the hands of electoral uh, administrators because they are the ones who can ensure that the electoral uh, process is uh, legitimate and uh, credible. So the big challenge here is, as Abraham Lincoln said in Gettysburg, we should dedicate ourselves so that we can have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people will not perish from the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. All your comments uh, were interesting, really interesting, especially this last part uh, where you talked uh, clearly about uh, the electoral system. Next, we have Arturo Sarocan, uh, please. Uh, thank you, Mari Carmen. It's a real pleasure to be uh, here with you. Thanks uh, to the INE and the School of Law of the National University of Mexico for their invitation to uh, join you in this uh, debate which is uh, fundamental not only uh, for uh, the U.S. democracy. I mean, we're talking about uh, a domino that uh, could lead that to a waterfall effect for liberal democracy elsewhere in the world. And if we were Croatia, for example, and we were on the other side of the Atlantic, yes, we would care about the election of the U.S., but maybe we would be more interested in uh, what happens in Germany, but we're not like Croatia. We have a, a border of uh, 3,000 uh, kil uh, kilometers, uh, uh, billions of dollars in trade, uh, uh, 5 million uh, Mexican-Americans, uh, uh, many of them undocumented uh, community of uh, uh, Mexican diaspora. Uh, uh, um, on both sides of the border. And therefore, whatever happens in the US will have a direct impact on the well being, the prosperity, security, and solidity of Mexican democracy. I know that it sounds uh, a cliche, uh, but I truly believe that, I mean, we always uh, hear analysts and experts and politicians uh, say that this is the most important uh, election ever. But there is no doubt that this is the most important election ever in the modern history of the US. And depending on the results on, uh, of November the 3rd, the country could uh, face a political existential uh, crisis like uh, we had never seen uh, before in the US uh, since uh, the end of the Civil War in the 19th century. If you look at the headlines of uh, uh, columns, articles, and newspapers, as well as comments uh, from political experts or pundits in, uh, on TV and the media, it's surprising uh, to uh, uh, notice that uh, we're talking about uh, defending and protecting and preserving the U.S. democracy. I believe that this is a sign of the high level of concern over uh, this significant erosion. Not precisely of uh, the democratic uh, architecture or mechanisms in the country, which uh, whether you like it or not, or you believe it or not, um, 
has uh, uh, failures. I believe that the, the electoral system has been uh, uh, surpassed by the reality of uh, the country. But I believe that the US democratic architecture is uh, highly solid. The problem is that in the last four years, we have seen a uh, process of undermining uh, the rules of uh, democratic uh, coexistence and what is expected from uh, the uh, presidential figure and the presidential discourse, which has only fueled a fire that, in my opinion, Anne and Richard have already described, which uh, talks about a highly divided uh, country, a highly polarized uh, country. I dedicated a as a recovering diplomat, I dedicated uh, all my life to uh, the Mexican Foreign Service, uh, especially working in the relationship uh, with the US. I've seen uh, diverse uh, moments of uh, the history in uh, the US, and I had never seen such a divisive uh, environment and even an environment of trivialization like the one uh, we're seeing today in the US. And rather than this uh, division between or this divide between uh, Republicans and Democrats and even this uh, clash around uh, identity uh, politics, uh, which we have seen uh, painfully uh, reflected in the streets of uh, US cities uh, during this spring of uh, turbulence and, and convulsion that we had never seen in the uh, US, um, possibly uh, since uh, the uh, end of uh, the fight uh, for civil rights in the uh, 1960s. Well, the first architectonic failure or divide uh, is uh, between uh, the cities and rural areas in the country where we have uh, this uh, significant crack. Um, let's uh, remember that uh, Trump lost 88 of the uh, most impor important 100 uh, urban counties in the country. And that uh, number uh, may only grow on this election. So we have this structural uh, failure and divide between metropolitan and rural areas in the US. And number two, between what I would call a coalition of transformation versus a coalition of restoration. I mean, unfortunately, one of the two uh, big uh, political uh, parties uh, in the modern history of the US, the Republican Party, which recently became uh, a white uh, insult uh, political party that is uh, leading uh, to um, uh, this divisiveness. On Tuesday, well, whether um, Trump wins or not, or Biden wins or not, with or without the tsunami, we'll see a process of uh, social demographic uh, and political tensions that will be complicated to overcome. In my personal opinion, what explains the fact that we're talking uh, today uh, in these terms about uh, the US uh, democracy and what is at stake uh, next November the 3rd? I believe that we will have to go back to three uh, phenomena that in recent uh, decades have had a significant impact on the democratic health of the US. The first one is what I would call um, media volcanization. When I was a child in the US, almost all uh, citizens would receive uh, news or would get their news or information from uh, three uh, TV channels, or three newscasts, uh, ABC, uh, CBS, and NBC. One of them was a little farther to the right, uh, the other one was a little farther to the left, and the other one was in the middle. In the last three decades, however, with this explosion of 24-7 uh, 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 news uh, channels. And with this boom uh, in uh, this boom of uh, social media, what has happened is that information and news are compartmentalized. If you're a Democrat, a Democrat uh, with a capital uh, D, which means that you have a democratic affiliation, you would read the New York Times, you would uh, listen to uh, NPR and you would watch uh, MSNBC. What do I know? If you're a Republican, at the minimum, you would uh, read the Wall Street Journal or you say you would watch uh, Fox News and uh, you would listen to Rush Limbaugh. What this has uh, uh, caused is uh, these ideological threats 
or uh, this uh, polemization of ideas, debates, and contrast of ideas uh, is broken. So you have this uh, situation where uh, filtering out anything that doesn't fit your values and your vision of the world. And what we saw in the past where people met at the center, well, this ideological center in the country has collapsed. I mean, if we had an opportunity to uh, uh, turn it into a graphic, into a graph, we could compare how the two countries have been um, moving apart uh, towards uh, the extremes and the center, the moderate uh, sector of politics is uh, almost empty because uh, these uh, two uh, political parties are moving uh, farther and farther away to the right or to the left, which means that uh, his has caused uh, uh, the possibility of consensus, dialogue, and respect in the center uh, to uh, faith. So this is the first uh, major issue we need to understand. The second is what in English uh, uh, they refer to as uh, the following. Maybe Anne, uh, Dana, or Richard can help me, but I've never uh, found a way to translate it into Spanish, the gerrymandering uh, concept, which is uh, the redistribution, the artificial redistribution of electoral districts, which I have never been uh, able to translate into Spanish properly. Every time I mention the term, I have to explain it so that uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, are uh, seeking not to be uh, 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 passed uh, um, through the right or to the left, which means that every time there is a Republican or a Democrat that is competitive enough, that a legislator is uh, more concerned about uh, being uh, passed uh, with more extreme positions within uh, their party. So the gerrymandering processes have led to save uh, districts where legislators are not motivated enough uh, to uh, listen to uh, uh, different uh, points of view or contrasting uh, points of view or having to establish a rapport with uh, voters that have uh, points of view uh, different from uh, those of the majority of voters in their districts. And the third um, issue that I believe has been uh, extremely negative uh, to the health of uh, the US democracy is a decision that Anne knows pretty well, a decision of the Supreme Court in 2010, Citizens United uh, versus uh, the Federal Electoral Commission that opens the door uh, uh, to uh, uh, campaign funding by corporations, uh, trade unions, et cetera. Uh, which uh, leads uh, to all these super PACs uh, where uh, money is uh, uh, coming in uh, into the campaigns without any uh, 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 obstacles, actually poisoning uh, the democratic electoral processes. So this, these three elements, the media volcanization and this uh, hollow intellectual, uh, philosophical and political center, and uh, these uh, processes of uh, gerrymandering um, and this decision by the Supreme Court in 2010 ha have turbocharged what was already a growing uh, ideological and political uh, polarization because uh, I must say it, it would be a mistake to say that, uh, that uh, it would be, I mean, we could not, it's difficult to understand, excuse me, uh, uh, the behavior of uh, the, pre uh, uh, the present, which is not a disease. It's actually a symptom of what's happening in the US society. If we add to this, the complexity of the electoral college, as well as uh, the possibility, uh, uh, which we cannot rule out, uh, of, um, Trump uh, creating some trouble. And I'm speaking about uh, this uh, Democrat uh, tsunami. I mean, there is a scenario that would allow President uh, Trump uh, to be reelected uh, through the Electoral College. If this happens, I mean, it will be a, a blow because that would be the only time in the history of uh, the US uh, where a president is first elected and then reelected, winning through the Electoral uh, College and losing the popular vote. And there is no doubt that if he wins the Electoral uh, College, Joe, uh, Joe Biden will uh, broaden uh, this um, margin uh, of uh, popular votes 
uh, for Hillary Clinton with uh, 3.2 million votes in uh, uh, recent years. Uh, he may uh, increase uh, that margin. And uh, finally, I uh, just to wrap up because it's been a long session and uh, also uh, many topics are repetitive. I want to say that the, there is a big danger and I'm talking about the, uh, this uh, gap of information on the night of the third, uh, which is possible because there may be uh, some uh, key uh, swing states, especially if we don't see um, the scenario of a, a Democrat uh, uh, tsunami. It is possible that states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, as a result of the impact of COVID in terms of increasing uh, the numbers of um, postal voting that has been referred to by my colleagues, there are states that on the night of the, of the third won't uh, be able or, to uh, declare a winner. And if they are essential uh, states uh, to reach uh, the 270 votes of the Electoral College, the big question would be, given the narrative and the rhetoric that uh, the president in the US uh, has used in the last few months, where he has refused uh, to say that he will uh, admit uh, the results, and especially considering that he's uh, talking about the potential uh, uh, fraud uh, via postal voting. It's a paradox because uh, the president himself is the one saying that uh, there may be a potential, a potential fraud against him via a postal voting system. And he has not made a commitment that to a peaceful transition of power. If on the night of the third, there is not a overwhelming scenario that minimizes these possibilities, we may find ourselves with a situation where the president would go out uh, to uh, declare that uh, uh, he has won or trends uh, favor him, which would create a legal, uh, political, and constitutional uh, uh, program uh, via uh, the roadmap that Anne and Richard uh, described, which could be hugely complicated. If we add to this, the possible uh, role uh, played by some uh, militias in terms of intimidating uh, voters uh, and uh, or uh, showing up at uh, polling stations? Well, I truly hope uh, that's not the case. I truly hope that the strength and the resilience of uh, the US democracy uh, prevails on the night of the third and, and the early hours of November the fourth. But depending on what happens and depending on how tight the results are, I'm sure that uh, the electoral system and the democratic system of the US will be subject, uh, subjected to the test or put to the test uh, like it had never happened in the history of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Sarokan. That was uh, an important analysis. I believe that, I believe that uh, the only thing you missed uh, in this conversation was uh, electoral uh, fracking. Okay, uh, really interesting. Uh, thanks a lot. We know that Ambassador Azarokan has to leave uh, because uh, he has uh, other engagements. He has a tight agenda. I don't know if you were able to cancel that, uh, uh, but um, okay, we understand you have to leave. Uh, thank you for your participation. It was really interesting. And we will follow you on uh, the coverage of uh, these upcoming elections and uh, we're really honored uh, to have you here. We'll stay here for a few minutes or more with our uh, um, speakers. We already have several uh, questions that were posted on social media from uh, the members of the audience. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. It's a real honor to be here uh, with uh, these uh, two uh, personalities of uh, democracy and um, Mexico, and especially at the School of Law of the National University and the National Electoral Institute. Well, next uh, we'll have our uh, Q&A, which will allow our um, panelists uh, to um, elaborate a little more on the electoral system of the US and uh, upcoming elections or ongoing elections. Uh, we're a few days away from the member the third. I've uh, classified the different uh, questions and I have two uh, categories. One is very specific. 
It has to do with the following. Some people are talking about uh, the capacity, the existing capacity of the superior, Supreme Court of Justice uh, to deal with uh, any potential uh, situations or problems. Members of the audience are asking, if in a scenario of tight uh, contested elections, if all of that gets uh, to the Supreme Court, the question is, if the Supreme Court has the capacity to timely and properly solve such a complex issue. Do they have a capacity? Several of the questions have to do with this, the capacity of the Supreme Court to deal with a potential situation like this. And also in the last uh, three elections, the intervention of uh, courts has been very clear. The courts of appeals and the Supreme Court have clearly participated uh, in the resolution of issues related to electoral aspects. And um, some people uh, re refer to what uh, Unravel said about this uh, disenfranchising that uh, prevent uh, um, some or many electors uh, from voting for reasons uh, that uh, may have to do with the uh, exclusion, gerrymandering, etc. So we're talking about the judicialization of politics and if uh, the court is ready. That's one first block. The second block has uh, shown interest in uh, postal voting. Postal voting. And uh, they, uh, they're they asking if uh, this... Uh, they're asking if uh, postal uh, votes uh, are as uh, safe as... Uh, uh, and as protected as actual ballots are uh, protected. So are there any measures in place uh, in addition uh, to protect uh, the security of the process? And then if you will consider um, votes received after election day, how do you, do you plan to address uh, that situation? And what could be the impact of uh, those uh, votes received after November 3rd on the results of the election? And also people are asking, uh, Lorenzo, if in Mexico, uh, the Postal Service has the capacity, if in Mexico, the Postal Service has uh, the uh, capacity uh, to uh, handle early voting. Uh, would you be interested in following that route? So let's uh, listen uh, to our uh, international guests uh, to uh, answer the first questions, and then we'll uh, give the floor to Lorenzo. Who wants to participate first, uh, Anne? I'm happy to. Con mucho gusto, Lore. Gracias. So um, on the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has the capacity. That is, they have done cases in the, the most famous one, Bush versus Gore, right after the election with Al Gore and George Bush. And so they are able to do that. One of the problems, there are two problems that need to be discussed. One of them is the United States actually does not have an enormous amount of uh, laws on the federal level that deal with the electoral process, interestingly enough. And so it's very difficult um, to know exactly on what basis they'll make a decision. And I, their Bush versus Gore is certainly a very contested decision that was made. Um, and so that's one question. And a huge issue um, in the United States now, which is that justice has just been sworn in um, in a very rushed uh, nomination and uh, hearing process, which is actually the shortest one ever in the history of the country. Uh, and And we are having trouble with your communications. Okay. Am I back? Now I'm back. back. Yes, yes. And many people believe 
uh, that that was pushed through by the Senate, Mitch McConnell, who is um, obviously close to the president um, and the president because of the election coming up and uh, that Trump wanted to make sure that he had a majority vote and it will is now six to three more conservative uh, justices um, who can overwhelmingly uh, resolve cases in his favor because the US Supreme Court has in fact over the years become extremely politicized as well. And so those are the issues that, that are of major concern. Sorry, thank you very much. And Richard. Bueno, yo creo que, uh, voy a comer... Well, I believe that uh, I would um, talk about um, postal voting. Yesterday, I just uh, I just uh, saw a presentation yesterday um, from uh, the unofficial uh, from um, the state of Washington, which was uh, the uh, pioneer when it comes to postal voting in the U.S. They've had uh, postal voting for more than thirty years, specifically since uh, two thousand and four. They have used uh, uh, mail votes in all their elections. Uh, this official uh, talked about uh, their uh, system. And uh, she also mentioned that other states are adopting uh, similar uh, measures, uh, including um, uh, barcoding uh, to uh, verify uh, the validity of um, valid envelopes uh, to protect the secrecy of voting. They have also implemented uh, systems that allow um, uh, the postal service uh, to track uh, your vote over the internet. I and my wife live here in Mexico, specifically in uh, San Miguel de Allende. But before that, I will live in uh, Colorado. So uh, we uh, received uh, our uh, electronic uh, ballots uh, from uh, Colorado. And we were able uh, to uh, vote on the internet, uh, which was a highly effective uh, process. So there is a system uh, that allows you uh, to uh, uh, vote uh, both ways, uh, by mail or uh, through the internet. And in both cases, you have a system available where you can track uh, your vote and make sure that it has been received. So yes, there are systems in place to control uh, these uh, forms of voting. Another interesting aspect is that the biggest problem, and uh, which uh, possibly uh, lead to a more problems, is uh, the verification of signatures. For example, uh, the Republicans uh, have a plan uh, to verify uh, signatures, especially in key uh, states like uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Florida, and others. And they have launched an intensive uh, campaign uh, to make sure that uh, signatures are valid or else they want to discard uh, these uh, votes or annul these votes. I heard uh, David Baker from the uh, uh, from the Center for uh, Innovation uh, in Washington. Talking about the image of uh, the electoral official, uh, the typical electoral official in the uh, year 2000 uh, with a magnifying glass, um, confirming that uh, signatures are all uh, true. And I told him that uh, we were going back to the same image of an official, uh, an elections official uh, with the magnifying glass uh, trying to verify signatures. However, I believe that uh, there are measures in place uh, to ensure the reliability and credibility of the process. Thank you, um, Richard. Uh, 
next time we'll have a Lorenzo Cordova. Thank you, Mari Carmen. Well, uh, just to answer the question, let me get to the point. In Mexico, we have a, a postal voting system, even though it's reserved uh, for uh, votes uh, uh, cast uh, by uh, Mexicans abroad. You may remember that, uh, Mari Carmen, in 2005, uh, the decision was made for uh, to the 2006 elections. Uh, the decision was made not to resort uh, to the Mexican postal system given its uh, structural deficiencies. The solution was uh, to use uh, package delivery uh, services. In the run up uh, to uh, the next uh, year's election, we'll have. Um, uh, votes uh, available uh, for Mexicans abroad uh, in 11 states. But again, uh, we're using package delivery services. Uh, they are expensive, but they are uh, they are a safe uh, way of receiving uh, those votes. In addition uh, to um, the fact that uh, voters do not, ha do not have to pay. For next year, we're considering the possibility of uh, evolving uh, over the internet with sophisticated um, security mechanisms. But these two mechanisms are only available for citizens abroad. However, I believe that uh, this could be um, good experiences that would allow us uh, to uh, discuss other possibilities or these possibilities in the near future to determine if uh, these uh, systems are worth it and they can be implemented uh, for the rest of the citizens. I recently heard uh, some news about uh, the uh, serious uh, limitations and deficiencies that uh, the Mexican Postal Service has. I mean, the US uh, Postal Service in the US uh, is uh, a really, really old um, institution. It has a long-standing tradition, despite uh, current questionings, they have a long history of uh, success. If we uh, made the decision uh, to use a uh, postal voting in Mexico, I'm not sure the Mexican Postal Service uh, could guarantee the process, but in those cases where uh, postal voting is received uh, from Mexicans abroad, we have instead uh, chosen uh, to follow a different route, package delivery services, which is more expensive, but um, that allows us uh, to receive uh, votes in time, even though it's more expensive. Thank you, President. Well, this would be uh, the end of our uh, discussion panel. It's been an interesting session. I want to thank each and all of you, including Anne and Richard, uh, for their uh, support and their participation. And we wish you the best of success in the electoral results uh, you're expecting and the organization of these elections uh, for the sake of democracy. And now I want to give the floor to the director or the dean of the School of Law, Raul Contreras, so he can uh, close uh, this uh, session uh, formally. Thank you, uh, Raul. Thank you, Anne, Richard, uh, Councilor, President, and thanks to everyone. Oh, if you allow me, please. Lorenzo Cordova and you uh, thanked me personally uh, for uh, participating here. But I would also like to thank uh, the uh, teams of uh, the INE and um, the National University, uh, um, uh, Emmanuel Carrillo and his team, uh, and, and the teams uh, from uh, the uh, School of Law of the University. I just did what I was told to do, but uh, you actually um, made the decision uh, to organize uh, this uh, seminar uh, over a cup of coffee, but it has been a wonderful team. Thank you. Thank you, Mari Carmen. I believe that uh, this uh, seminar had a, a very great start. Uh, it got off a uh, good start. I want to thank uh, the audience uh, for listening to us. And I want you to know that this was a formidable event. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Dana, uh, for uh, being uh, part of this uh, seminar. 
And uh, also, uh, thanks uh, to uh, Mr. Sarokan. As a scholar and a specialist in uh, constitutional law, I and we uh, see in the US uh, the first uh, modern constitution that uh, gave way to uh, constitutionalism. We believe that uh, the US democracy is an exemplary uh, democracy with an admirable uh, Republican system. In Mexico, we have made uh, many changes uh, to our uh, constitution and, and Mexican laws. Over the course of these uh, last uh, decades, we have made these changes to strengthen our electoral system and overcome all these uh, obstacles that we have uh, discussed here. Uh, we do not allow uh, people uh, carrying weapons uh, in the uh, polling stations from around them. And uh, we make sure that uh, electoral officials uh, are accredited. For a long time, uh, the uh, federal legislation has exerted uh, control uh, to prevent uh, states uh, from uh, making their own decisions. I mean, to the prejudice of elections. And that has also allowed us uh, to, uh, to strengthen uh, the uh, National Le Le Electoral Institute. After uh, this session, I'm sure that uh, Lorenzo, for this reason, must uh, feel uh, happy, but also motivated so that we can um, increase this type of efforts so that uh, upcoming elections are better and better. As analysts, we would like these comparative uh, law studies uh, to also be used by the US so that they can um, really um, embark on a major uh, electoral reform to make sure that uh, uh, the votes of their citizens uh, do not face uh, that many challenges. We are in favor of uh, the victory of democracy, social peace, and we hope that uh, the U.S. continues to be a prosperous uh, country and the neighbor with whom we have always coexisted and in which we have a lot of interest. It's been a pleasure uh, uh, to listen to you and, and Richard. And I don't know, Lorenzo, if you would like to say some final words and say thanks again. Hey. I just want to tell uh, each and all of you that uh, we are uh, honored uh, to have had you here. This uh, information has been very enriching. Uh, we have learned a lot about the uh, US electoral system. We're only a few days away uh, from uh, uh, the US elections. We will continue uh, to analyze uh, your system, maybe uh, in uh, after uh, the elections. But each uh, country has uh, their own electoral system. The one we have developed in Mexico is uh, the one uh, that we believe is the best uh, for us. But I believe that these comparative uh, law exercises are always useful uh, so that we can uh, further discuss how to strengthen our democracies in times where these problems they're facing in the US are also a problems we have in our electoral systems. We're talking about global challenges. I believe that uh, the time where we spoke about the problems of uh, consolidated democracies and developing democracies are left behind or have been left behind and we're now facing common global problems. There is not a unique solution. We need to study each other. We need to understand each other and uh, provide the feedback to each other on uh, best uh, practices. This seminar has been key. Thank you, Anne, again. It was a real pleasure. Uh, ever uh, since uh, you were at the Federal Electoral Commission, uh, uh, you have been a great a partner of uh, the INE. And what to say about the Richard uh, uh, when he was at IFIS, IFIS uh, before he settled in Mexico. And Dana, uh, thanks a lot uh, for uh, your support and for uh, joining us uh, again. It's been a privilege uh, to have your presence and uh, thanks uh, to uh, the Dean of the School of Law for this uh, strategic uh, partner with the uh, INE. Thank you. Gracias. 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 Gracias.